really a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, you here. It's um, uh, a meeting organized by Friends of IHS and the Simons Foundation. So uh, I would like to thank Jim and Marilyn for making this event possible. And um, so in two words, uh, IHS is a French uh, institute uh, in mainly in uh, pure math and theoretical physics. And uh, we have a, a small uh, staff of uh, very high level uh, people. And we host uh, every year more than 200 visitors from uh, all over the world. And uh, one third of them are American based. And uh, here in the US, we have uh, the sister uh, association, Friends of IHS, and uh, Jim and Marilyn are actually our co chairs. And uh, you just be became uh, co chairs. And uh, so it's uh, another very good occasion to thank you again. And uh, today, uh, we will have a lecture by Sylvia, so which is a French mathematician uh, now at NYU for some time, and uh, uh, she has been awarded a lot of uh, very distinguished prizes. And the last time I saw uh, Sylvia lecturing, it was at the International Congress in Rio. She did a wonderful uh, keynote uh, speech. And even if I was very far from her topic, I think it's one of the best talk I saw uh, from all this week. So I'm sure you will enjoy it a lot. And thank you, uh, Sylvia, for doing this talk for us. But thank you very much for the kind words. Now you're, you're setting up uh, high expectations for me. This is, uh, <laughs> thanks all for, uh, for coming to, to support IHEF and um, to listen to a little bit of science. Uh, I must say that it's a, it's a first for me. I've never given a breakfast talk before. So, um, so, so it's, a, it's an interesting... Um... <laughs> Okay, so I want to tell you a, 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 a short story about, uh, of course, um, uh, a story that starts from physics and that leads into mathematics and intriguing mathematics. And this is not uncommon, of course, as you know, and it, it fits well, I think, with the spirit of IHES and the Simons Foundation. Uh, and, and, and so uh, let's start the story with the superconductivity, which, as you know, is a phenomenon that uh, happens in uh, particular metals and alloys. It was discovered in the early 20th century. And what happens is that uh, in these materials, when temperature is small enough, if you cool them down enough, uh, suddenly they lose their resistivity and they can flow superconducting currents. And they're explained by a microscopic theory now via the uh, appearance of Cooper pairs. Uh, and one of the striking uh, features is that the superconductor then starts to expel a uh, magnetic field. This is called the Meissner effect. And so you see on this picture, um, a magnet is levitating uh, above a superconductor thanks to the, the magnetic forces that are created around uh, the superconductor. So what I'm going to be interested in here is a regime where you cross a certain critical field that's called HC1. You know, the intensity of the first critical field. So it means you have in enough magnetic field that's applied to your, uh, to your superconductor uh, so that it, it cannot repel it completely. So this Meissner effect starts to break down. And instead, uh, you see uh, how it's described, the magnetic field starts to penetrate a little bit. And it penetrates through some sort of flux lines uh, through some special uh, tubes that are called vortex tubes, vortices. And these, uh, these vortices are sur surrounded by superconducting current loops here, pictured in green. And what is found is that uh, these vortices 
become more and more numerous as you increase the intensity of the external field and they repel each other. Uh, so they repel each other. However, they are, so, they are also confined to stay together by the magnetic effect. So it's as if they are both confined, but also uh, pairwise repelling. And the result of that, these two competing uh, constraints, is that uh, they tend to form uh, these beautiful triangular patterns, these triangular lattices. So this is called uh, an Abrikozov lattice, and these are uh, observations in superconductors. It, it was a beautiful uh, success of, of theory uh, when the physicist Abrikozov, who got the Nobel Prize for this, um, first predicted from the basis of the model on superconductors that there should be these periodic patterns of vortices. And, and then they were uh, looked for and observed. So it's one of uh, a great success where theory prediction precedes experiments. Um, so, you know, we're sort of intrigued by this phenomenon, like when you repel each other, you have a crowd of vortices, but they have to stay together. Why do they choose to organize themselves in these triangular lattices? That, that's, that's sort of the main mystery here, at least for me. So I told you that Abrikozov predicted um, the, the, the vortex lattices from the model. The model is the one that was brought forward by famous physicist Landau together with Ginzburg, they both also got Nobel Prizes for this. And this is the functional, right? You don't have to read it all, but uh, th this is the, the sort of order, what's called the order parameter. This is the gauge of the magnetic field. And you have to minimize this to understand the, the, the ground states of your system. And well, from this, you're supposed to see that you're gonna have triangular lattices or vortices. It's not very transparent there, but in fact, you can almost do it. So it takes some work. So let me again describe this model, right? So what are the vortices here? They're gonna be the zeros of this function Psi and Psi is a complex valued function if that tells you anything. So zeros come with a winding number. And then you have all the sort of magnetic um, data, so the intensity of the applied field you see here is a parameter you can tune. A is the gauge, like in Maxwell's equations, if you want. Epsilon is a material parameter, usually it's denoted. Um, in physics, it, we talk about kappa, but epsilon is the inverse of kappa. We're gonna take it small. Uh, and here, this is a two-dimensional uh, description, sort of matching a little bit this picture that I showed you here, or this picture. Okay, so I told you there's some work, but you can do it. And the work we did, other people also participated, is that when epsilon goes to zero, you can do a sort of asymptotic analysis. You do see that the points that are the zeros of psi uh, have this uh, repulsion. And this repulsion is a Coulomb repulsion or a logarithmic repulsion because we're in 2D. Uh, it's as if these vortices were behaving like uh, electrostatic charges, even though that's not what they are, but they're acting like charges that are quantized in the sense that their charge has to be a, an integer. Okay, so you can derive this rigorously uh, mathematically, and that actually leads us to um, studying a discrete problem. And I'm gonna describe that in terms of a Coulomb gas. Coulomb, you know, uh, in, this is all going back to the 18th century, was the first to postulate uh, the electrostatic interaction between point charges as being uh, inverse of the distance. And then uh, you have Poisson's equation that relates the potential generated by a charge density to the charge density. And you see it involves Laplace's operator. And what is the connection? Well, the connection is that the fundamental solution to the Laplacian is the Coulomb interaction. So it is this, if you want to solve for Laplace's equation, you might wanna just solve for minus Laplacian equals Dirac. 
And then based on that, you can recover uh, the solutions to Poisson's equation by convolving with this, uh, with this solution W. And W happens to be uh, exactly the same as what you see in Coulomb's law of interaction. So let me write it here, in a just more descriptive form. This is the W, this is the Coulomb interaction. In dimension one, minus the distance. Dimension two, minus log of the distance. So I told you it's going to be logarithmic in 2D. Uh, dimension three, that's what Coulomb had first postulated, one over the distance. And dimension bigger than three, one over x to the d minus two in general. So with that, you solve Laplace's equation and you find the sort of fundamental interaction of, of nature. Really. So after we've seen that these vertices interact logarithmically, well, you can ask yourself, let's, let's look more generally now. I have an assembly of points, x1, xn. For example, my vortices, but maybe something else. It doesn't have to be uh, in superconductivity anymore. Uh, and let's look at these points with these pair interactions. So you see the repulsion between xi and xj via this w that I showed you uh, before. So for instance, minus log of the distance. And here we, we add, just for convenience, we add some confining potential. That's to keep the points together so that they don't fly off to infinity. So V is something smooth enough, growing. Okay, so this is always repulsive. Uh, I, I put myself in the simplest case, so I have only repulsion. So when Xi becomes close to Xj, you see, uh, minus log near, near zero, that's very large. So this thing blows up. It's very repulsive, it's singular. Every time two points want to get too close to each other, the energy becomes infinite. So they really don't want to be close to each other. Okay, so this is the sort of um, simplified model for the interaction of these vortices. But now we can consider it in a much more general setting. We can be in any dimension. We don't have to be in dimension two. Uh, and we could look at other possible interactions maybe not one over x d minus two, but maybe general inverse powers of the distance. We call that Reese interactions. Okay, let's understand, for instance, you might want to understand what are minimizers looking like. So again, there's going to be this feature that you know, they want to repel each other, but they have to stay together collectively. So the competition between these two should lead to these interesting patterns. What's going to happen in higher dimension? We've seen what happens in 2D, but um, so you can also generalize this to manifolds. If you're interested, people do that. They study uh, Reese energies on manifolds. That's nice in the way because you don't have to add the confinement. If you're in a if you're in a closed manifold like the torus, you can just look at the interaction. So this is called the Reese S energy. Uh, and having this parameter S is kind of nice because now you can tune it and you can start to play with S. You see that when S goes to zero, uh, formally it's the same as the logarithmic case because you can, uh, well, you can expand near zero and see that it's like a logarithmic interaction. And when S goes to infinity, this is the best packing problem. So the best packing problem is I give myself points. Around each point, I put a hard sphere and, I and, and the hard spheres cannot overlap. Right? So it's like billiard balls. And then you ask to put the maximal density of balls per unit volume, like to, to pack the, the space as tightly as possible with those uh, hard spheres. So that, so this is 2D for now. I, I mean, the picture here that I drew is 2D, but you could draw it in any dimension. But that's a 2D representation with hard disks. So you see in 2D, these hard disks, here they are drawn to form, again, the triangular lattice. Intuitively, you can guess, oh, that seems like the best. What else are you going to do? And, and of course, if you are in 3D, um, you see it on the, on the market when the uh, people pile up oranges, right? You, you want to pile up, like do layers of this, but then shift it. That also seems to be the best way to pack uh, hard spheres. But you're going to see it's not an easy question. 
continuing with manifolds, here is what you what you see if you're in a on a on, on a sphere, right? So the on a soccer ball or on the earth. Uh, and here what's plotted is you maximize product of distances, which is the same as minimizing minus sum of log of distances. So again, again the logarithmic interaction. These are called fiquete points, the things that uh, maximize these products of distances. Um, and people are interested in that for all sorts of reasons. One of them is computational, like you want to put points to interpolate on a sphere, like let's say you wanted to compute things on the surface of the earth, you wanna have well distributed points. How are you gonna put your points as uniformly distributed as you can? That's one solution. They're also interested in that for carbon molecules which have these soccer balls uh, structures. Okay, and you see here that there's, obviously the points are uniformly distributed on the sphere. That seems natural. But they also form interesting patterns when you look close, closely, they, they microscopically, so there's a sort of microstructure and the microstructure, you, you do see something that's reminiscent of the triangular lattice, uh, except now you have this sort of topological problem, which is you can't really, uh, you can't really tile your sphere with a very nice lattice, so you have to have dislocations, like these things that are called scars. So again, uh, something quite intriguing to try to describe. On the torus, that's kind of fun. Uh, here it's the inverse power S, uh, optimal distribution of points. And you see on top here, the points prefer to go on the outside of this torus because that's, um, you have larger distances collectively, right? Whereas if you go to the inside here, these guys here and those guys there would be closer. So it arranges itself like this. There is a uniform distribution, but only on a subregion of the torus. And then there's a critical S above which suddenly the distribution becomes uniform. So the existence of that critical S is called the poppy seed bagel theorem for obvious reasons. Um, but again, if you look mic microscopically, Oh, uh, maybe, maybe after all, it's the same. It's it's still these triangular patterns. So again, something not completely clear, but to be understood here. So maybe it doesn't depend on S here. Right. So now we have this interaction, and we've tried to minimize it, right? To we can try to do something else, which is we can add temperature. And that's what uh, statistical physics will tell you to do. Uh, let's now look at probability of seeing the particles at x1, xn, so probability density, uh, which is now the, like the Gibbs measure. So it's exponential minus beta times the energy. So what this does is it says, okay, you don't want to see just minimizers. You want to see uh, configurations with, you know, sort of higher probability if their energy is lower, but you also want to see other possibilities. And this is going to be mediated by this beta, which is the inverse of the temperature. So when the temperature is effectively zero, then beta is infinity, then you're really weighing this thing very much towards the minimizers. But when beta is very small, uh, you essentially have no interaction. Okay, so there's gonna be a whole range in between depending on temperature where you expect to see well, what's called temperature effects. So I said, you can do this. You can put this into this Gibbs measure. Why not? But in fact, this is an important model um, in physics. These types of things arise uh, uh, in quantum mechanics. If you want to describe the fractional quantum Hall effect, you end up looking at things like this with logarithmic interaction in 2D. It's a toy model for plasmas. Uh, plasmas are considered as you know point charges with Coulomb interaction. It's also quite important to look at this when you let the charges be possibly positive or negative, where now it's not just repulsion, but the charges with same sign do repel, but the charges with opposite signs attract. Uh, and that's that's the sort of other side of the story, which is also quite important in theoretical physics. Whereas in particular, it's related to this 
a special type of phase transition that happens in two dimensions that was predicted by Kosterlitz and Taules. Again, some recent Nobel Prize happened uh, related to this. So there's actually many reasons to look at things like that. And another reason I'll describe now here concerns particularly the logarithmic interaction that I mentioned, which you can think of as an inverse power, right? I told you log belongs to this family of inverse powers up to a sort of little asymptotic expansion. So um, it's eigenvalues of random matrices. So what are random matrices? You know, physicists started in the uh, 70s, I think 60s, 70s, under the impulsion of Dyson and Wigner to try to understand the spectra of very large atoms. Uh, what is the sort of typical spectrum of a large matrix? Right? This is, if you understand what happens for a large symmetric matrix, Hermitian, then that should be a model, a good model for a, a large atom. So they started with the simplest thing you can do, which is draw the entries of your matrix at random, make them IID. That's the simplest possible thing, and make them even IID Gaussian if you want. First case. Okay, so let's let's say you take a large matrix, make the entries IID Gaussian, and impose like they were doing some symmetry. So let's say the matrices are Hermitian. So it's not quite that it's IID, you, you only draw half of the triangle at random. Well, then you find that the law of the eigenvalues, which you can compute, you know, uh, algebraically, is exactly uh, of the form that I described here, which means that's that's the partition function, that's the that's the Gibbs measure of a Coulomb gas, we call that a Coulomb gas or a Ries gas. So it's exactly like a Coulomb gas, or more precisely, a log gas in 1D. It's not quite Coulomb, but log. And if you do uh, with real symmetric instead of Hermitian, you get a slightly different Coulomb gas or log gas. Sorry. So here it's for beta equals two that you should, you should find. And here it's for beta equals one. Always have a quadratic confinement. In the case with no symmetry, uh, you just draw your entries uniformly at random to be complex numbers. And so now your eigenvalues, instead of being in the line, so here you see you get a law on the line, here a law on the line. Yeah, now here you get a law in the plane, a law for the eigenvalues. And this thing is called the Ginibre ensemble, and it's exactly a 2D log gas at temperature beta equals two, inverse temperature beta equals two, with quadratic uh, confinement. Okay, and now here you see a plot of a typical uh, set of uh, of eigen um, eigenvalues of a complex random matrix like this, and you see it's very it's very clear. They go uniformly in a disk, right? It's a uniform distribution in the disk. And now microscopically, it's less clear. Uh, there's a sort of shaky distribution of points. What you should be able to see is that they repel each other. They don't like to be too close to each other. There is a logarithmic repulsion, uh, which is seen in the Gibbs measure, uh, which is called repulsion of eigenvalues. You see it, whether it's 1D or 2D. So the, the eigenvalues typically don't like to be too close uh, to each other. So let's continue and see that more systematically. So here we're plotting a two-dimensional log gas or Coulomb gas with quadratic confinement. So because of this sort of uh, rotational symmetry of the confinement, you expect things to be kind of rotationally symmetric, right? So you, you are not going to be surprised to see that these points, they always lie sort of in a ball. That's the effect of the confinement, right? They have to sort of stay together and it has to be rotationally invariant. But now let's play with the temperature as a parameter, beta. So we're gonna start from high temperature, which means relatively low beta, and we're going to decrease the temperature. And you're gonna see the effect it has on the point patterns, it's always kind of uniform, vaguely uniform in the ball. You Maybe you believe me for that. 
But you see, as temperature gets decreased, the shaky nature of the patterns diminishes and becomes kind of less and less shaky. And now you see towards the end, as temperature gets very small, it actually becomes quite regular. And well, eventually you would believe that you have sufficiently many points. And if beta really is infinity, you should see a triangular lattice. Okay, so what's happening? In order to describe that, we're going to do a sort of a, a zoom, and uh, because we want to understand these patterns, right, at very small scales. I told you about the micro scale, the macro scale. What you want to do is you want to zoom your point configuration, so your points are going to lie in some set. In general, it doesn't have to be a ball; it can be another shape. Then you zoom, and you see these points that are now well separated. And you imagine that n goes to infinity. n is the number of points. Huh? So as n goes to infinity, the, your configurations, your blue, your red, your green, are going to fill up the whole space. And once they've become infinite configurations, we define a sort of infinite volume energy for them. So I won't give you a formula yet. But let's say there's some W, some energy on infinite point configurations, which are to be understood as a jellium, if you know physics. So it's infinite number of positive charges with a uniform negative background charge. And so we proved that you can do this as n goes to infinity, you can make this limit rigorous, that you have this uh, energy. And what is the end result? Is that with temperature, there's going to be a limit, what's called a point process, which means it's a point configuration, but it's random also, because you remember we're, we're drawing things according to a probability law. And that limiting point process, if it exists, or maybe there might be several, but must minimize the sum of two things. So this Coulomb interaction energy plus one over beta times a certain relative entropy. OK, so here, you don't need to have the definitions, but in, in physics, physically, this is not surprising. An energy plus 1 over beta times an entropy, this is always the kind of structure you expect in a, in a statistical uh, physics problem. It's a free energy, if you want. Uh, and what you can think of is that there is a competition. right? If you want to make the sum of two terms small, you have to see what they want. The first term, W, my interpretation I'll give you is that it prefers order. We think, we think it prefers order, like it would be minimal maybe at this triangular lattice in 2D. The relative entropy here, that's relative entropy with respect to the Poisson point process, that thing prefers the Poissonian distribution. What is the Poissonian distribution? Is when you throw your points uniformly at random, independently of each other. So you just have a, a rain of points, and they don't care about each other. Okay, so that's kind of more disordered. And I'll show you a picture, maybe right now. So you see on the left, that's the Poisson point process. The points get to fall wherever they are, uniformly. They don't feel each other. On the right hand side. Is plotted the Ginibre point process. That's the one you get as the limit of this planar log gas or Coulomb gas at precise temperature beta equals two. What happens is that when beta is equal to two, we know how to compute everything. We have a little chance in a glimpse into the system when beta is two, thanks to a particular algebraic structure. And that's why we can plot this. Unfortunately, for other values of beta, we don't have access to such things. So this, what, what presented before, is a characterization of the point processes that value for any beta. And that's what we, that's one of the things we know. So you see, the competition, when beta is very small, that means very large temperature, just Poisson. When beta is intermediate, some competition between wanting to be ordered and wanting to look like this. And when beta uh, 
is uh, infinite minimizers, we expect them to crystallize, right? We expect them to finally find their um, periodic minimum. So let's look a little more at that question. So what we would want to do is understand the minimizers of this W Coulomb interaction energy or Reese interaction energy. You want to work with Reese. So I have a formula for you. The formula is uh, when I restrict myself to periodic point configurations with little n points per period. So imagine you're on a torus or imagine you have a, a square, a box. You're gonna have n points that are gonna be free in that box. And then you're gonna repeat that pattern periodically, just copy paste it, okay? So that's periodic, but it's not necessarily a lattice that already allows you for some freedom because you can move those endpoints the way you want. So that's the interaction of these endpoints or the, 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 or, or the interaction of the total system copy pasted from these endpoints. It has a sum of interactions, G of pair interactions plus some constant. And this guy G, not too surprisingly, ends up to being the Green's function of the torus. So it's like our, it's exactly like our coulomb reese interaction, except it's periodized, it's made periodic. And now it's much more complicated. You can't find a very simple form for it. Uh, you can write it in the form of an Eisenstein series, and now you get yourself into, a, into the world of number theory, really. So we're still with that question, what do minimizers look like? And can we say that there are lattices, like the triangular lattices I showed you for superconductors? So now let's sidestep a little bit and let's ask ourselves, how often is it that we can answer a question like this? The question is, you have some interaction say big U, pair interaction potential, xi minus xj, you have an infinite number of points. So maybe you do it like this. You look at the points that fall in the ball of radius r, you sum all the pair interactions, you divide by the volume, something like that. How often do we know that the minimum is achieved at a periodic configuration? or even, at, even better at a lattice? So the answer is in 1D, we can do it usually, that's okay. In higher D, there's very few instances where we can prove something like that. It's actually an important question. The, the, the crystalline structure of matter depends on things like that, not exactly this type of interaction, but, and I, we don't really understand it from a mathematical point of view, we can't prove it. So I told you about sphere packing earlier, right? The hard spheres in the plane. So in the plane for this hard sphere thing, yes, we can prove it. The triangular lattice is the minimizer. Uh, there was some sort of, if you want, generalization of this that were, was obtained by Radin, more on the physics side and by Tile on the math side. That shows that you can have the same result for a sort of caricature short range Leonard drone potential, some, some interaction like this, you see where you have a very steep decay, a very steep well here. So it prefers a certain distance, and then goes to zero. So it's actually quite close to hard sphere interaction because hard sphere is just saying the interaction is infinite until distance one, you know, until distance the size of the ball, and then it becomes zero. So they were able to extend this crystallization result to that. Uh, there's the honeycomb conjecture that was solved. So that's a story about tiling planes by hexagons uh, and minimizing total perimeter. There's the 3D sphere packing, that's the oranges on the market. That was solved actually not so long ago by Hales. Uh, and then we get to this really nice stuff, which is the Cohn and Kumar conjecture. So that dates from the 2009. So what they say is 
there are special lattices that happen only in dimensions 2, 8, and 24. Very special things. The sort of mystery of numbers, if you want. So in dimension 2, the special lattice is the triangular lattice, or friend, that we've seen before. In dimension 8, there is some guy that's called the E8 lattice. Dimension 24, the Leech lattice. I won't give you the exact um, definitions. And these lattices are universally minimizing. That means if you take an interaction, as long as it's completely monotone, essentially, uh, then this, this, this lattice is the optimal. So what completely monotone means? Okay, so it means you have to be a function of the distance square, and this function has to be decreasing. The Coulomb interaction satisfies that. All these Ries interactions satisfy that. It has to be decreasing, and it's derivative. Uh, so derivative is negative, right? And then second derivative has to be positive. Third derivative has to be negative, et cetera. You alternate. So really, like this inverse powers, that's the type of thing you want to think of. OK, so they uh, conjectured that. And that includes sphere packing, by the way. So suddenly, well, the sphere packing problem, maybe in dimensions 2, 8, and 24, can be solved. I mean, 2, it was already done. 8 and 24, that's new. Uh, so what they proved was, uh, was for regular interactions. So you might wonder, well, well, well these Ries interactions, Coulomb, they're singular at the origin. Maybe it doesn't fall in that category. So we proved a little you know, lemma, if you want that if you can do it for smooth interactions, you can do it for Coulomb or Ries. It implies the same result. It's not restrictive. Really. Okay, and so then there was a, a breakthrough that happened three years ago now. Beautiful work of Marina Vyazovska. She was able via a sort of new transform, the introduction of new transform on modular forms, very deep stuff to prove the conjecture for the sphere packing problem in dimension eight. Then quickly, it was extended to the dimension 24, again, sphere packing, uh, by uh, work with her and Konkumar Milarachenko. And then they attacked this full Konkumar conjecture, which is about all interactions, not necessarily sphere packing. And they solved it in dimensions eight and 24. So that's nice. That's the first time that, other than dimension two, we can say something about minimizers being periodic. OK, it, it is, it is a, in these sort of odd dimensions, right? Odd in the sense they're, not, they're even, but they're odd. Uh, they're, um, they're weird, right? Y8 and 24. But now it says that our W, our, our Coulomb or Ries you know, interaction for infinite configurations, now we have an answer in dimensions uh, eight and 24. It does crystallize. Now we know things crystallize and you can plug it with temperature. You can let beta tend to infinity and show it crystallizes. By the way, dimension one, you can also solve, right? Um, now let's not be uh, carried away in some sense into thinking that in any dimension we should see lattices at zero temperature because another mystery, but in high enough dimension, minimizers are not lattices. So it's like when you, when you pass dimensions around 11, you can start to see counter examples. There's better things to do than doing a lattice when dimension is large, except you come back to 24 and suddenly it's better again. But, okay, so it's actually much more subtle than that. I can point out also that if you're interested in doing dimensions very large, it's not just a curiosity because uh, it's not physical, but it's actually of much interest to theoretical computer science and coding theory to understand, uh, for example, sphere packing or interaction energies in very large dimensions. Okay, so we're left with a, still a conjecture. Ah, dimension two, we still don't know. <laughs> Because their conjecture, they didn't prove it in dimension two, which we, one could think would have been easier, but no, it's harder. 
So we still don't know, but we believe that the triangular lattice is the global minimizer of these coulomb reese interactions. And of course, that's in a way supported by experiment because we saw the triangular lattices in the experiments on superconductors. We observed them. And we proved, remember, we derived rigorously this W from the ginz borando energy. So here we have a path straight to that function. So if the cohen kumar conjecture is true, that gives you a proof uh, of crystallization in superconductors in these uh, triangular, in these abricots of lattices. Okay, so what there is, the only thing there is so far is a restricted result that says the triangular lattice is the best among lattices, just among lattices. So say you look at all lattices of a fixed volume, you have to normalize things, you compare them. So is the triangle better than the square, for instance? And the answer is, Yes, the triangular lattice is the best. And that's related very directly to a result from number theory from the 50s and then revisited in the 80s by Montgomery, the famous result that says, well, if you look at this thing that's called the Epstein zeta function of the lattice, so you see you sum here over the lattice, one over p to the s, this thing is minimal at the triangular lattice in 2D. Huh? So here you see the series converges. So S is bigger than two. Uh, so it's not completely obvious that it has anything to do with the original problem. So you have a little transform that you have to make. Uh, but you can derive from that the question about the W within the class of lattices. And now to show you the extent of our ignorance, we don't even know how to prove something like this in 3D. Like we don't even know how to prove that a certain lattice is the best among lattices. In dimension three, there's two, there's actually, well, there's two or three candidates to be the best lattice. There's the BCC, there's the FCC lattice, and there is not a universally minimizing lattice in 3D because you can at least numerically check that uh, BCC is better for uh, long range interactions and FCC is better for short range. So there's a transition. So there's, there cannot be a universally minimizing lattice even for these monotone interactions. And we can't even prove or find the best among lattices. Uh, that's a question for you know, people doing number theory. Uh, all right, so ah, right on time. Um, to conclude, well, I, I hope I've shown you that if you're interested in Coulomb and Ries interactions, there's many motivations for, for those important physical systems, superconductors, random matrices, quantum mechanics, plasmas, blah. And that in the end, they involve an interplay of analysis, probability, geometry, number theory, so I've, I've sort of swept under the rug. We do a lot of that analysis and a lot of that probability. I haven't told you how we do it, but there is, there is some. And then one can rigorously extract from these mathematical problems, some difficult uh, mathematical crystallization questions for which we have very few answers and many open questions. So I mentioned is the triangular lattice really universally optimal in 2D? That's the cohen kumar conjecture, the part that's remaining open. How much of this behavior is really specific to Coulomb and Ries interaction? Is the monotonicity really the question or not? There's also questions I haven't talked about, but is there a finite temperature phase transition for crystallization? in a 2D or 3D Coulomb gas. So when you re go back to the case with temperature, physicists say mostly on numerical basis that they see a critical beta above which you have a solid and below which you have a liquid. And we see that mathematically. Okay, so with all these questions, I leave you and thank you.
random tables. So how do you put the temperature into the in, into the formulation of the random matrix tool? Or even more simply, what might you meet your target? Uh, none. None. Okay, because the, the 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 temperature. So how? What you do is you you draw your eigen uh, your entries to be Gaussian. Okay, then you compute uh, the law of the eigenvalues, and it's gonna come as a, there's gonna be a, a van der Mond determinant, product of x i minus x j. <laughs> put that in the exponential. You just put it as exponential minus sum of log. So you see it selects beta equals two because uh, because the the, the, the van der Mond is for i strictly less than j. So if you want to write it as sum over i different from j, you have to put a one half. So naturally the temperature is two if you want. And then people can extend uh, in one d for the for the laws of eigenvalues on the real line. You can find matrix models for one, two, four. And then there's people that have really worked tweaking the thing it's it's a little bit far-fetched but you can find a matrix model for any beta in, on the real line but uh naturally these gaussian models they sort of select the temperature which is two let's say and so you that's why you you that's why i told you when beta is two we can compute we have this matrix model you have a lot and when beta is not two we're sort of leaving uh the world of random matrix theory. I think you have to press on your mic, so I'm supposed to tell you this. Huh? <laughs> um, first question, I mean, in, in the matrix case, uh, so you show that you have some repulsion between the eigenvalues. Do you also have the same phenomenon of repulsion between the, the eigenspaces that they correspond to the eigendirections, so the eigenvectors? And the second question is uh, when you go, I mean, find something in 3D, uh, is there uh, any uh, cases where, uh, like you know, Penrose quasi periodic lattices uh, can go uh, can, can be one of the solutions, or they are still far away from the uh, from the regular lattices? Uh, so about the second question, I think in theory it's plausible. We don't know. We don't know. Why not? I don't think that's what people believe from the observations of simulations. And yeah, that's true. About the first question, so um, what people uh, show is this uh, notion of delocalization. So you look at the eigenspaces and you check that the eigenvectors distribute themselves uniformly. And that's related to quantum chaos also. So they, they do study these eigenspaces. So it's not a repulsion, but it's a question of localization versus delocalization. Pressure. Um, well, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned about uh, some applications of uh, sphere packing to theoretical computer science and coding theory? Is it something related to computational complexity or error correcting code? Do you think you can explain a bit more? I think so, but I'm, I'm getting into dangerous territory because I'm really not a specialist of this, but I think yes. Uh, I, I think one of the points is, uh, for instance, it's it's simple, right? You have a very large dimensional um, signal, and you want to represent it by only uh, a, a small subset of points. And so that's why you wanna uh, you wanna pack the space with balls that are quite small, such that if you uh, if you replace the the signal in any ball by the center of the ball, you're not very far off. So. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's related to that. The expert, if you want to in investigate more, is is Henry Cohn. Okay. Thank at, you very uh, much. Microsoft. I have a question coming uh, online from Denis Serre. It's about Hi, <laughs> so it's about uh, one of your slides. If you can just come back, I think it's uh, it's the slide that precedes just your conclusion. 
Yes, and he, he's asking, is the volume of the lattice prescribed? Yes, I said. <laughs> yes. Ah, fixed volume. Okay, Denis. <laughs> Denis. You had a question? Yes, I have a one technical and one non technical <laughs> remark. So the technical <laughs> remark is that this beat ensembles, sometimes it's better to uh, think of them not in terms of the matrices, because it's for beat to not equals to two, it's, kind of artificial it's not very bit. natural. Mm -hmm. But you can always reinterpret them as uh, random partitions models. That's true. Yeah. So, and then that has a meaning for any value of beta and some relations to gauge theory in four dimensions. Yes, and, yes, yes. But... And, and the kind of a fun remark, uh, so these dimensions two, eight and 24, with which you have the special, this uh, sphere packing problem is, is solved. These are minus two, the critical dimension of bosonic string, super string and n equals two string. Uh, so there is some, some relation to string theory there. Even more intriguing. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. So, oh. Later. Thank you. My question was mostly about uh, the dynamic with the temperature, as you mentioned a little bit with the, the beta factor. You said that for some transposition, uh, it might be possible that we can have a threshold for, for a value where we can have crystallization. I was just wanting to know in terms of the dynamic of um, the evolution of, if you were to change the temperature, do you see some property in terms of behavior of how the temperature, uh, you show some, how the temperature evolve and what's the link between the, that evolution and the structure when you try to optimize, do you see some discontinuity? Yes. So, so uh, to repeat the question, it's uh, the question about crystallization in terms of beta. What is the evolution that you see when you change beta? And so the uh, the the sort of conjecture, I would say, numerical conjecture, is you, what you should see is a transition from a exponential decay of correlations to algebraic decay of correlations. So you 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 have to look at it in terms of the of the correlations between far particles, and uh, that's how it should um, manifest itself. So it's a slightly different notion, but it's a different notion from what the crystallization I described. Now oh, we have a question here. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you took the mic first. Any more questions? Okay, well, let's all thank Sylvie for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming.